Hey everybody, uh, we're gonna try this today, see how this goes uh, for a lecture format. Um, that way you can see my beautiful face um, and hopefully that makes it more interesting for you uh, as we talk about today's topic and we'll see how this works. Um, let me know what you think. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about absorption coefficients and absorptivity. We just talked last time about room modes. Um, hopefully you're working on your discussions uh, with those right now and we'll wrap that up in the next couple days answering those questions and whatnot and so as we move forward we're going to talk about kind of the three main things that are really important to keep in mind with uh, studio acoustics and that is absorption uh, diffusion and isolation and so uh, thus we're going to start that path right now talking about absorption coefficients and absorptivity so we start with this uh, the law of conservation of energy, um, the, which is also the first law of thermodynamics, if you're a physics nut, and that basically says energy cannot be created or destroyed, um, but it can be converted from one form to another. So like when we want to absorb sound in a room, we have to do something with it. It has to, we can't just like eat it, right? That doesn't really work. Even that is converting it from one form of energy to another, if we can make that happen. But what we have to do is take the sound energy, the acoustic energy, and turn it into heat. Um, and that's most of the time uh, what happens with absorption. So there's a few different types of absorbers, and most of the time they really fall into the category of what we see under porous absorbers. That would be like the Oralex or any other uh, panels that you just see in home studios or, or even some nice studios have some, you know, that Oralex type foam or something else. A lot of times uh, more sophisticated porous absorbers are built and it might be something that's based off of um, insulation or or some other fibrous material but basically that it does a, those do a pretty good job of absorbing high frequencies. Um, they can be effective at absor absorbing low frequencies but you have to think through a few things we're going to talk about towards the end of this uh, discussion and um, we'll get to that. The other types of absorbers that we're going to see a little bit, we're not going to go into as much depth with those, but the other type of absorbers that we see is that called a panel absorber or a volume or a resonance absorber. And so that's kind of taking the idea that we've talked about in the past in terms of like the Helmholtz resonator and we calculated frequencies uh, at, for Helmholtz resonators like the acoustic guitar body. You can do the same thing to build an absorber at a specific frequency based on that same uh, Helmholtz resonator uh, concept and those calculations. So, um, the first thing we're going to talk about, and this is really one of the more important ideas to everything that we're going to discuss with absorption, is, is absorption coefficients. And an absorption coefficient is super important, is related to a material, a material, a material, a material. This is something that people confuse a lot uh, with the next, next subject that we're going to talk about, um, absorptivity. But absorption coefficients relate to a material's effectiveness at absorbing sound. And that varies with frequency. Um, obviously, if I have this little blanket, that might do a pretty good job, as you can maybe expect and think about at a, absorbing high frequencies, but that's not going to do a whole lot for us uh, at absorbing low frequencies. So all of this is based on, uh, we talk about absorptivity or lowercase alpha here. That's what the, the symbol is varies with frequency and so we say if a material if 55 percent of the incident sound energy is absorbed at some frequency the absorption coefficient is 0.55 so a perfectly reflect reflecting surface which would be any sort of you know if you talk about marble or really really hard surfaces they're perfectly reflective and they have an absorption coefficient or case a of 0, 0.0 if something is a perfect absorber then we say it has an absorption coefficient of 1.0 so everything for the most part, falls in between that one and zero and is either uh, some degree of reflective or absorptive at different frequencies. So um, most of the time as we look at absorption, co absorption coefficients, excuse me, um, we look at them at different standard frequencies. And these are the ones, again, absorption coefficients deal mostly with studio acoustics or more uh, high-end or thought-out rooms where acoustics and acoustic treatment is is the big deal. There's a more 
um, stripped back concept that we'll see in just a few minutes um, that's not so precise as to take all these different frequency ranges, but these, these are the octave band centers that, that are standard. We see for equalizers and other things, 150, 250, 500, 1K, 2K, and 4K are the standard frequencies at which uh, absorption co coefficients are quoted for different materials. Um, and the charts vary. Maybe sometimes they're even more uh, precise than this and have different uh, frequencies in addition to those or fewer based on who their customers are and what gets used. But you can find these all over the place online. Um, contractors reference these. Um, architects, obviously, that gets way more in-depth if you're talking about studio design or high-end listening room design. Um, we get really specific. But I'm just going to try real quick here to pull up. Um, if you do absorption coefficient chart, you can find all sorts of ones. Um, here I pulled up. Uh, just one random one online, and you can see all those different frequencies that I just quoted, and then just a listing of materials, and then from zero to one, again, remember one being uh, perfectly absorptive, zero being perfectly reflective, um, how absorptive it is at each one of these frequencies. Meaning, look at this, carpet is a 0.01, meaning it does very, very, very little for us at 125 hertz, but it actually does a uh, sort of okay job uh, absorbing 4K, those much higher frequencies. And so there's here's for some floor materials, here's for some seating materials. Again, everything, um, everything has an absorption coefficient. And if you really go digging and looking, people who are taking this seriously, I mean, there's absorption coefficients associated with people and seats and not just the walls and the flooring material, but couches and chairs and different furniture that you might see in a room. All of that stuff is taken into account so you can make calculations to know what a room is going to sound like before you spend maybe several million dollars building something. Um, and so here's seating material and reflective wall materials and absorptive wall materials and ceiling materials, um, all different types of plaster and sprayed cellulose and wood ton and groove. And this is um, just one example. These, these, again, these lists are all over online uh, to varying degrees. Uh, you can just do some searches and find some ones that look interesting to you um, and take a look uh, to calculate some things out. Um, I am actually, while, while I'm on uh, Safari here and we're online, um, I'll go ahead and pull up. So Oralex, uh, is a common, you know, project studio acoustic treatment. They've got a lot of projects, products that we see. You see these thicker things that look like this that are designed for, for different types of bass traps, the Leonard's and the Metro's and the Venus here. Okay, let's, we'll maybe come back and talk about this in a second, the Venus bass, bass trap. This is actually, I think it's two, um, what is it? It's one foot by two foot and a foot deep. Let's, let's take a look real quick. So a case of those is 500 bucks, and what is it? It's, oh, it's two foot. Two foot by four foot and 12 inches deep, okay? Um, so that's, you know, that's a pretty substantial absorber. We don't see those a whole lot. We see much more commonly, um, let's go back a little bit. Uh, these, we see, oftentimes these two inch wedges or pyramids or something like that. Let's go back and now let's go in. They have performance data for all of their products specifically because they're designed for, you know, uh, studios and whatnot. And let's see, let's take a look at a two inch wedge. And there's a test sheet here that has a lot of logistics and stuff on it that we can go through and look. It talks about mounting it and stuff and whatnot. But then here they have actually a little bit more detailed chart that has 100 hertz, 125 hertz, 160 hertz, um, and absorption. We're going to talk about this idea in just a minute, but here is the absorption coefficient. So you can see at 100 hertz, this two inch thing doesn't do a whole lot for us, right? And this is the problem that people run into. People, you know, that maybe don't have uh, an acoustic training or haven't dug real deep into how this stuff works. They just see, oh, I know I got to go get those those panels to put on my wall and my 
practice room or in my studio or whatever and um, or people who cover their whole walls with you know egg cartons or like old, old 70 studios with carpet well, what that actually does is most of the time it just eats up high frequencies it doesn't do a lot doesn't do hardly anything for us in the low frequencies where we're already struggling in smaller rooms and smaller spaces because of the room modes like we talked about last time and so if you just put up uh, these two inch pyramids or wedges or something like that and too much in your studio what you're going to have is a very very dry space from a high frequency standpoint like if we look let's find where is it these are actually incredibly absorptive like once we get up to 4k so they're basically perfectly absorptive at one at 4k or even as low as almost as low as 1k i think they usually yeah they have a chart here that shows its absorption report and the frequencies down here yeah we're not doing a whole lot down at 100 hertz and we increasingly become more effective as we move up towards uh, 2k 3k 4k and then it's actually very effective at those super high frequencies um, but that's just naturally the case for anything that's that narrow um, and we're going to talk about why that is in just a second um, we'll do actually let me go grab one more of these let's let's go ahead and go back and look at that uh, 12 inch venus trap that we looked at that was two foot by four foot by 12 inches deep and you can see this one's laid out a little bit different. It's, a, it's an older chart, but we can see absorption coefficient um, is absorptive all the way up to a one. And so you can see this is actually across all frequencies. It's very, very absorptive. And I guess they don't have a chart because that wouldn't make a very interesting chart. Okay, let's go back to this real quick and see what we can do with that information. So we've talked about absorption coefficients. And remember, absorption coefficients are the effectiveness of a material at absorbing different frequencies. And now we're going to change and talk about this idea of absorptivity. And that is the property of a room. Okay, write that down. Take deep notes. I will definitely ask you about that on an upcoming quiz or sometime about keeping those two ideas straight. And absorptivity is relates to the measurement of how a room can absorb sound based on, just like we talked about, the materials of that make up the room as well as everything that's in the room so we can um, calculate that that is called absorptivity and is a property of a room whereas absorption coefficient is how well a material uh, can effectively absorb at different frequencies so absorptivity we take and we multiply the surface area of the room by all the different absorption coefficients and we have to do this again if we're going to do this legitimately and seriously for probably a more critical listening environment like, a, again, the high-end listening room or a studio or something like that, then we're going to have to do this process that I'm going to talk about in just a second uh, five or six times. So we do it at 125 hertz and 250 hertz and 500 hertz and 1K and 2K and 4K. And we calculate all these things out so we can see we don't get the situation where, like we just said, we have a, a studio where we put just uh, two-inch absorbers all the way around and I have an extremely, extremely dead room at 1k and above but i have um, just lots of low frequency issues this really boomy low end room because i haven't done anything to address those problems um, so we do this at all those different frequencies so we can try to to have that be an e the room have an even frequency response and we take the absorption coefficient of whatever that wall material is by the surface area of that wall. We do surface areas, you know, length times width, okay? And then we add the surface area of the floor, which is, again, we to do um, surface area, it's length times width, whatever, whether we're talking about the floor um, or the walls or the ceiling, um, length times width gives us the area of that square or rectangle times, um, so that gives us the floor, and then we add that same idea for the ceiling, and we get an answer in sabins. It's like, whoa, 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 what are sabins? What? What's a sabin? Don't worry. Don't worry. 
A Sabin is just like, um, Sabin's the dude who helped come up with this equation and this formula to calculate all this stuff. And so if you come up with a thing, they name it after you, right? Like they do for all sorts of other things like Hertz and um, whatnot. And so um, a Sabin is a measurement for this idea of absorption or absorptivity in a room. And so we take in that it's the sort of the, the reference unit, as you can say, just like the reference of human hearing when we talk about uh, SPL and whatnot. Um, the reference is this idea of an open window is considered a perfect absorber because when we have an open window, sound goes out that open window and it doesn't hit any reflections, doesn't come into contact with anything and come back into the room. It never returns back into the room. So that idea of we take, a, if we had a one foot by one foot square window that was open, the sound left the room, um, that would be the equivalent of one seven. We had a 10 foot by 10 foot window in a room where that much sound could leave through that opening unaltered, not to hit anything on the way out, not to be reflected by anything after it leaves and come back in, that would be 10 sevens um, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, we'll get to, to this in a minute, how this, this all works, but if you have uh, 20 foot, 20 square foot of carpet with an absorption coefficient of 0.55 at say um, 250 hertz, then you would end up with 11 sevens of, at 250 hertz for what that carpet is contributing to the room. Okay, let's do some math. This is acoustics class. It would not be acoustics class without some math. And so let's calculate some absorptivity. And so hopefully you can see this down here. We're going to Calculate absorptivity, capital A. Again, let's go back and jump back again. Absorption coefficient was lowercase alpha, the lowercase a with the little whoopty, right? And absorptivity is uppercase a. And so uh, we're gonna calculate absorptivity, uppercase a for a room. We're gonna do this one in meters. Um, five meters long, five meters wide, and four meters high. So if we just, again, just get our brains in the mental area, for what that means in terms of feet. I mean, we can roughly say something to the effect of what, 15 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 12 feet high. So your brain can start to picture it. And we're gonna do this first with marble floors, plaster ceiling, and concrete block walls. So again, I mean, as soon as I say that, hopefully your brain has a point of reference to say, ooh, that's a pretty big room. I mean, it's not a huge room, but it's, it's, a, it's a decent sized room with lots of hard surfaces. Your brain can picture the idea of that room being very, echoey, right? More so than even this room, this kind of, I'm in a decent sized room right now with not a lot of soft materials in it. And so maybe you're hearing some echoiness, even with the fact that I've got a microphone right here. Um, and so uh, this one is this, this calculation again, you have to do this at all the different frequencies. So this calculation that we're doing right now is only for 1K. So the absorption coefficient for marble at 1K is 0.01. And the absorption coefficient for plaster, which is the ceiling, is 0.05 at 1K, and the absorption coefficient for concrete block walls is 0.07 um, at 1K. And so we type that into this equation. Um, that we just talked about here, in theory, and do it for real now where we say, okay, the absorption coefficient is 0.01, and I have to take the surface area of the Let's see, we're talking about the floor, and so the floor is length times width, which is 5 feet times 5 foot gives us um, 25 times 0.01 is 0.25. And then we're going to take and do the ceiling, and the ceiling is um, plaster, which is 0.05 absorption coefficient. Same idea. Ceiling is 5 foot by, or 5 meters by 5 meters. Sorry, I swapped units real quick five meters by five meters um, times 0.05 absorption coefficient gives us 1.25. And the walls, um, I can do the walls, I can cheat a little bit here and do these walls a little bit quicker because the width and the length is the same. So remember it's five wide, five long, and four high, right? So I can do, I can do that, I can kind of cheat and go, well, to get the surface area of the wall here, I can say it's four 
times five gives me the surface area of one of the walls, and I have four of those because this is, would be a perfect, this would be, um, have all four of those be the same. So I can do four times five times four times the 0.07 absorption coefficient for the concrete block walls, and I get 5.6. I add each one of these things together, and I get 7.1 meters squared. What, what, what is it though? Sabins. Sabins is the unit. So I have an, an answer of this room that we just talked about. Five meter by five meter by four meter high room with marble floors and plaster ceilings and concrete block walls. I can have a pretty good prediction that that room with nothing else in it is going to have an absorptivity of 7.1 satins. Okay. So what the heck? What am I going to do with 7.1 satins? What good is that, Mark? What am I going to do with 7.1 satins? I have no use for 7.1 satins in my life. Well, right, okay. We'll get there. But first, before we get there, let's do this one more time, but let's change a couple of the materials, okay? So what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna go back and we're gonna use the same room, but you know what? Somebody tried to teach in that room and they realized they could not understand what in the heck was going on. Maybe it was like, remember how there was problems in the business school? When they first built the business school, there was no acoustic treatment. There were these big, beautiful rooms with all these hard surfaces because it was cool, but nobody could understand what the instructors were saying because it was so reflective. Um, this is also the case with other, I think there's been a couple other places on campus that they've had to address this. And so we're going to change, we're going to put carpet down. Um, it's not as pretty as the marble, but it maybe will help us a little bit. We're going to put carpet down and we're going to put in actual acoustic ceiling tile, not just like generic tile, but like, you know, you, there's different types of ceiling tile you see that have the uh, perforated holes and, and things like that that are actually designed to absorb uh, better than standard ceiling tile. So we're going to put in a really good acoustic ceiling tile. The carpet has an absorption coefficient. We're, going to, we're still just talking about 1K. And again, we're, we're only doing this like to give you this, a snapshot. If we were doing this for real, we do this at all five or six of those standard frequencies. So you'd have a better idea of the overall frequency response of the room at different frequencies, the absorptivity of the room at different frequencies. And so we're going to take, put in the carpet, put in the uh, acoustic ceiling tile and see what that does for us. And so we do the same math, but we plug in 0.2, we plug in 0.99 for the ceiling tile, and we plug in 0.07 because the concrete block walls are still the same. Now we end up with 5 plus 24.75 plus 5.6. I'm not going to go back and longhand do this math again. You can rewind. That's the beauty of doing it this way is you can rewind and watch me do that a little bit lengthier. Uh, like I just did two minutes ago, and we end up with 34.4 sevens. Okay, so again, what does, what does that mean? What do I do with 34.4 sevens? Um, we'll be there in just a minute. Uh, but first, I, I will say, take a, a minute to talk about this, uh, what's called NRC, or noise reduction coefficient. Do I have that right now here? Oh yeah, noise reduction coefficient. NRC. Um, absorption coefficients, like I said, are typically quoted at 125, 250, 500, 1K, 2K, 4K. Again, we looked at the acoustic or the Oralex acoustic treatment, and they are actually even more specific than that, again, because they're specifically a studio material that's used to treat studios, and so they had it broken down even farther than that. A lot of times, in terms of generic building materials and generic spaces, even just, you know, uh, we're pretty fortunate at Music Tech to have lots of well-treated rooms that are easy to listen and talk, listen to music and have conversations in that are thought out from a sonic standpoint. But for average rooms, um, classrooms, average um, spaces, they, they don't worry as much about the, the vast range and they just take an average of 250, 500, 1K and 2K. They boil it all down and so you can just do this, this process once with an NRC number or a noise reduction coefficient number um, that uh, doesn't take into all the, again, it's probably usually going to be skewed um, and not take into account as much low frequency information where there might be problems, um, but uh, it's really more useful at speech frequencies because of the way that these get averaged than anything else. And so, again, at least it gives you a ballpark if you're talking about a, just a standard church classroom or uh, other speaking uh, space like that. Um, so that's NRC, noise reduction coefficient, just an average of 
these frequencies as opposed to having it individually broken down. Um, a few more things with porous absorbers. And um, so we talked about uh, the acoustic foam that we see, um, even standard uh, insulation that gets used in houses can be um, used sometimes. Um, but again, what we're trying to do, what we have to do is we have to take acoustic energy and turn it into a, something else. And what we have to do is basically turn that into heat, right? And so our absorbers, when we're talking about a porous, a porous absorber, then we have to make sure that whatever we're using to try to absorb these frequencies has the right density so that um, it can be effective. If it's too loose of a material, then little energy will be lost to heat because the acoustic energy isn't uh, interacting and crashing into each other enough. And if it's too dense, then uh, enough air energy and air motion can pass through the materials so that we don't get enough friction and um, contacts and connection to be effective as an absorber so that it is turned into heat. Um, materials, cellulose, mineral fiber, fiberglass, rigid fiberglass. There's, I thought I had this somewhere. There's this really common material. Um, I'll just look it up real quick. OC that, that is used for actual acoustic panels. So the, the nice acoustic panels that we have, and I think all of our, no, there are a few of the older ones still. The nice acoustic panels that we have almost everywhere in our studios, particularly the, the, the Studio B, the ensemble rooms upstairs, the mix and edit suites, um, are, are the rigid acoustic panels, and they're based off of this stuff or a very similar product that's just like Owens Corning 703 is kind of the standard. Has a really great density to be effective for this stuff. Um, there's Owen Corning's, owning, excuse me, Owen Corning 705 that can be sometimes used. It's a little bit even denser. That's not, not as good at high frequencies, but um, is better at making bass traps. Um, and so that, that density that you're familiar with, if you've brushed up against, hopefully you don't mess with them too much, but if you've brushed up against the um, acoustic panels at school, then that is an Owens Corning, very similar to, if it's not Owens Corning 703, it's a product that's very similar to that density. That's a, that you'll notice is it's rigid. It's much more solid than the type of, just like the pink fluffy insulation that you go buy at the hardware store. Now that can be somewhat effective. It's probably not as effective again because it's not quite dense enough to be effective. But what I've done in the past and I know other people have done using the pink stuff is you can compress it. If you can make it in such a way, if you frame it in such a way that you can compress it a little bit, you make it more um, effective at absorbing frequencies than if you just let it expand to its uh, standard depth. So, um, let's go ahead and go back to the show. There's some pictures of the Owens Corning 703 here specifically. Um, let's go back and so I just mentioned the pink fluffy insulation and sorry, I should have thought about where I was going. And you know, that looks something like this stuff, this stuff right here, right? You've seen pictures of this stuff. And then if you've never done construction before, then we get what we call here craft faced. And so you see the insulation and then you see kind of just like that brown paper bag covering. It's called the craft facing. Um, that makes that stuff easier to install. If you've never worked construction, that can be a miserable, miserable thing to do because um, it gets all over you. It's super itchy. If you're not careful and have a mask on, you breathe it and it's awful. Um, but if we go back and take the idea of just using that standard house insulation, 
And so R19 insulation is the insulation that you would use in two by six frames. So if your wall framing is two by six studs, the um, insulation is about five and a half, five, five and a half inches uh, deep. And it is rated at R19. That's an insulation rating for heat purposes. Um, R11 is what is the rating for insulation that's for two by four walls. And so here is just a cool chart that shows a couple of things, how effective just using standard insulation. So we'll look at the R16, or I'm sorry, the R19, which is for six and a half, six inch studs. And you'll see that, you know what, actually um, it's pretty effective until I get down to about 250 Hertz. And so what is that? Six inches. Let's think about that. We'll come back and talk about that again. That, that, that depth um, is important. Um, it's pretty effective till I get down to 250 Hertz. But if I want to just actually prob combat low frequency problems in a room, if I can make absorbers, absorption panels out of this type of insulation, if I leave the paper towards the wall and the insulation towards the room, or towards the sound, it will absorb all high frequencies. If I turn that around and I make my absorption panel uh, so that the paper is facing the room and, and the sound, not against up against the wall, then I'm still effective at absorbing the low frequencies, but it turns into a reflector, that paper turns into a reflector um, for the high frequencies. And then just to compare for the two by four walls or the R11 rating, that's because it's only four, about four inches deep. It's only effective up to, you know, just about 500 Hertz. Okay. And the same holds true for how effective it is at upper frequencies, whether you have the paper out or you have the insulation out when you build the absorber. Now, a few slides ago, five minutes ago, I said, what do I do with this Sabin? We did a bunch of math and I got an answer that was 7.1 Sabins. I don't know, have any idea what to do with a Sabin. Well, what we can do with a Sabin is take and figure out reverb time. And we can actually do this. This is, again, think of if we're doing this legit, if we're doing this for real in a room that's, that's actually critical before we're going to spend a bunch of money, then we do this five or six different times at all of these different frequencies. But what we can do is we can figure the reverb time. Once, we've, once we know the materials, the size and shape of a room, we know what materials is built off and we know that equation, we can figure out before we ever step foot in that room, what the reverb time is at different frequencies by using this equation. And so here's the equation if we're using feet, here's the equation if we're using meters, it's just a, a constant that uh, it works out based on how this RT60 is reverb time. Uh, if you don't remember, we take the volume of the room, which would be, again, if we have a cube, we do length times width times height. That gives us the volume. And then we take that absorptivity number um, and so we do, what would we do? We do 0.161 times volume times divided by absorptivity. And here is all that done up. Here's our room. Here's how we did it the first time when it was 7.1 sevens. And we do length times width times height, volume. Here's our constant divided by 7.1 and we get a reverb time at 1K. Again, those, those numbers were for a 1K frequency. Gives us 2.26 seconds for a reverb time. Um, which makes sense if you're in a space that, uh, that seems a little long, but these are our really hard surfaces. That, that, could, that could be pretty close. That uh, should be close. Um, and then if we change that to carpet and that absorptive tile, we had 35.47. So you see by putting that large number on the bottom of that equation, that we end up with, the larger that number is, the more this number goes down. And so we end up with 0.45 seconds as our reverb time at one point. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, um, go back and try to do the math again. Let me know if you have questions, okay? Okay, 
So again, quarter wavelength. How many times have we talked about quarter wavelength and how many different ways and places have we talked about quarter wavelength um, this semester that's uh, applicable to so many different things. And so um, absorption in quarter wavelength. And again, this idea of displacement and pressure amplitude and how those two things are, are 90 degrees out of phase and offset. And so again, like we've talked about several times, at the wall, the velocity of a wave is zero, or the displacement is zero because that air molecule can't go anywhere. It doesn't have anywhere to go. That's why pressure amplitude builds up up against the wall and you can walk along the wall, you get into the corner and you hear the increase in low frequencies in particular because uh, the velocity is zero at the wall, or the displacement is zero, the pressure amplitude is highest at, at the walls, okay? And if we want to, if we go back and really think, remember the really trippy GIF I showed you that how that we took pressure amplitude and velocity and acceleration all interweaving weaving together and how they're related. Um, go back, you can search for that GIF and uh, trip out on that for a while if you want. And um, so at the quarter wavelength away from the wall, the velocity is at a maximum. And that's where absorbers need to be a, as deep as a quarter wavelength at the frequency you are trying to affect or placed at a, or placed at a difference equal to the quarter wavelength away from the wall. So what does that mean? Um, let's break this down and unpackage a few things. Uh, remember how effective the Venus absorber was and it was 12 inches deep, right? Um, and so we need to be far away from the wall to combat low frequencies. We need to be we need to be approaching on that acceleration maximum that happens at the quarter wavelength um, to slow down that wave and eat it up. And so, um, that, which is why things that are thin can't uh, affect low frequencies. But, 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 and this is big. Um, if you're not gonna buy or can't afford to buy huge base traps, and think about this, like, those, those base traps were very expensive. And the other thing that they do is they, they eat up all of your wall space and they make your room smaller. But if you get creative and you take this last part into account or placed at a distance equal to the quarter wavelength away from the wall, then you can take, and if you take that same two inch absorber and you mount it four inches or six inches away from the wall, then you can start to affect lower and lower frequencies the more you move that out away from the wall. If you take a, let's say you go, you're having problems in your room at low frequencies um, and you take and you go buy a uh, comforter, a duvet at Walmart or something, you hang that up against your wall. If you hang that up against the wall, you're only going to be sticking out, what, an inch or two? And that means you're only going to really be combating, you know, something in the neighborhood of 2K or something like that, based on, um, or, you know, we could even figure it out real quick. We could say what a foot is a, a 1K tone is about a foot long. So if a quarter of that is um, three inches. So if I'm three inches out from the wall, I can eat up 1K pretty good. Um, so if I want to be, if I want to eat up 500 Hertz, if I move that out, six inches away from the wall, then I can get down and combat 500 hertz. Um, so if you have low frequency problems, you go by that duvet and you hang it against the wall, it's not gonna do you a, very much good at low frequencies, but if you move it out so it's six inches, eight inches away from the wall, then that actually can slow down um, the acceleration of the wave and, and start to absorb um, and combat those lower and lower frequencies. Um, also, yeah, I threw a picture in here real quick of uh, just like if you have blinds and, and you see this can actually be a really good idea. If you, if you have some sort of weighted blinds or the, if you were ever in Digitrax uh, studio, they had really, really cool heavy weighted velour um, curtains all around their big library. And you can move, you can pull those out or push them back if you wanted to make the room brighter or more uh, absorptive. And just that idea of one, having this mounted a little bit away from the wall, but then also the, the groove pattern that, that this creates, this weaving in and out, um, allows you to combat a variety of, of frequencies and, and move into being able to combat low frequency problems. Uh, real quick, I don't, I don't wanna 
belabor these last couple ideas. Um, we won't do any math with these on a test, um, but then I just wanted to mention a couple other absorber ideas, which is the panel absorber. And then, so that's the, something that maybe looks like this. It can actually, you know, can be metal or whatever, but it's the idea where I've got a perforated sheet that lets sound in, I've got an absorptive layer, um, and I basically build this at problematic frequencies. So the air being trapped, I have an air gap here, and then the sol solid wall backing um, and so the, the depth of the airspace and the mass per unit area, if I'm talking about feet or, or meters, depending on that will change. Um, but the depth and the mass per unit area determines what frequency I want to build this absorber. It's, it's, again, it's for combating specific problems and something that I would say more often than not, is done as a corrective measure rather than a design philosophy. Same is true for um, a slat absorber, which is, again, I don't even have the equation out here for you, but based on the slat depth, the slat width, um, and the depth from the wall, I can build an absorber that, I mean, this looks like something that's reflective, and actually I'm gonna get some variety of diffusion based on the grooves that are cut and the slat width, but based on the slat width, depth, and the, and the depth from the wall, you can build this to absorb uh, specific low frequencies that are problems in your room, much like this Helmholtz resonator absorber. Again, we've done the math for the Helmholtz resonator a few times. Um, it might look like something like this put up in the corner where low frequencies collect and are a problem. If I build something, if I say I have a problem, a really bad problem, specifically at 150 hertz or something like that, I can build a Helmholtz resonator that's uh, based on a that based on a design of 150 hertz. If I fill this with insulation, um, then that will do a good job of, of eating up that specific frequency based on its design. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, I rushed through some of this probably a lot more than I would have in class. But again, the beauty of this is um, that uh, you can rewind. You can watch it ten times. Wouldn't that be great? Um, or uh, rewind specific sections, and then we'll have a discussion on Canvas about this. So uh, let me know what questions you have, and we'll talk about this more soon. Have a good day. Stay safe, everybody.